is more la David. Adonai rohi lo echsad. In otesha yarvitseni ame menuchot ya nachaleni. Nahashi shovei. Ya nacheni v'magle tzedek l'ma'an shemo. Kan ki heleich v'gitzol mavet lo yirarai ki atah imadi. Shivtecha u'mishantecha hema yenach amoni. Ta'aroch lefanai shulchan neged tzorirai. Tisham tavashem en roshi kusiri vayad. Ach tova chesed yildifuni kol yame chayai. Veshaviti Vevet Adonai Leorech Yami Eternal God, you are my shepherd, I shall not want. You make me lie down in green pastures, you lead me beside still waters. You restore my soul. You lead me in right paths for the sake of your name. Even when I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. With rod and staff, you comfort me. You have set a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Truly goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Eternal forever. Esayinai el heharim, me'ayin yavo ezri, ezri me'im Adonai oseh shamayim ba'aretz. I lift up my eyes to the mountains, what is the source of my help? My help comes from the Eternal, maker of heaven and earth. God will not let your foot give way, your protector will not slumber. Behold, the protector of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. God is your guardian. God is your protection at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. Adonai shmor tzetecha uvoecha me'ata ve'ad olam. May the eternal guard you from all harm. May the eternal guard your soul in your going and your coming now and forevermore. Death has summoned our beloved John Fisher. Our souls cry out unto you, O God, what are we? Are we the creatures of dust whose destiny is but to return to the dust from which we came? The ancient sage has taught us the spirit of the human being is the lamp of the eternal. Not even the darkness of death can extinguish the light which the Eternal has kindled in the sanctuary of the human soul. Therefore, O oh God, we thank you in this solemn hour for that which was deathless in the life of our cherished John, and which is now revealed to us in all of its beauty. For his love that united us in life, and which death cannot sever. For his companionship which we shared along life's path, and which still continues through the tenderness of memory, for the gifts of his heart and of his mind, which brought us joy and happiness and now have become a precious heritage of the spirit. For all these and more, we give you our praise. Grant unto us, O God, the strength of all the generations of our people, who in the face of bereavement proclaim, Adonai Natan, Adonai Lakach, Yehi Shem Adonai Mevorach. God has given, God has taken away, 
still. Blessed be the name of God. In ancient people, we are well acquainted with grief and with the valley of shadows. Death and sorrow are not strangers to us. Yet the centuries have taught us that a good name endures beyond the grave and that there is strength in faith. With Job we say, Adonai Natan, God you have given. You gave us a loved one who will not be forgotten. For all that was good and enduring in his life, we offer the deepest thanks of our hearts. Adonai Lakach, God, you have taken away. We pray for the strength to turn our broken hearts into an altar of trust before which we acknowledge your sovereignty and your love as we now say, Yehi Shem Adonai Mevorach, blessed be the name of God now and forever. written that an artist in the course of painting will pause, set down his brush, and take a step back. In that pregnant pause, the artist will assess in which direction to proceed. A little color here to make it darker or brighter. A little more texture there to smooth out the brush strokes or make them more dynamic. And then when his days on earth are completed, He'll call this his masterpiece, his lifetime, my life. For John Fisher, the master artist, life had many different shades of color, early on light, but then for a period that came to be known as the Holocaust, there was the darkest color humanity had ever known. Stepping away from the picture at that juncture, he calculated that with great perseverance and a masterful touch, he would be able to transform the rest of the canvas of his self-portrait into a thing of beauty and meaning. The philosopher Viktor Frankl, a survivor of Auschwitz, believed that we are not defined by what happens to us, but rather by how we respond to what happens to us. John Fisher had the fortitude, the courage, and the pragmatism to respond by picking up his paintbrush again and adding light and joyous color to the rest of his 93 years of life. John was not only an artist with his brush and with his pencils, but with his words put to pencil. In December of 2010, Marcy finally convinced John to write his memoirs. And with some editing by Dennis, this became the way that he shared many details about the traumatic years of his life with his family, details he'd never really shared before. His memoir reads like a Steven Spielberg script. John uses his words to paint a picture of his early life, which began in France in 1925, named Jean Hicken. He was the son of Emery and Isabella, and he described in detail what he remembers as a kind of charmed life. When he was three, his loving grandmother requested that the family return to Hungary to be close to her. His father was a noted photographer and found employment back in Hungary. And, he, and the family continued to thrive in a relatively well-to-do kind of life. And shortly thereafter, his sister Augie was born. <coughs> he described his home as nicely furnished and conveyed that his mother dressed the children well. Although they were not an Orthodox family, they kept many of the Jewish traditions. And Ronnie just saying, your dad made a point of writing that his father built a sukkah every year. Already at the age of nine, John was aware of the growing enthusiasm around him for Zionism, and he became active in Beitar, an activist group preparing for the return to Palestine 
and in a Jewish Boy Scout troop. These were fond memories. A bright student with a natural curiosity about things, by the time John was 14, he was ready to learn a trade and was working as a bookbinder and a paper box at, and working with a paper box machine shop. At about the same time, John could see the degree of anti-Semitism and incidents becoming more frequent and closer to home. In May of 1944, John, a strong 19-year-old, was taken to a forced labor camp in what would be the Ukraine to help build airstrips for German aircrafts as they advanced eastward. His autobiography is a history of Hungary as it changed hands and loyalties so that John's group went from the status of worker to becoming prisoners overnight. On the march from their work camp heading to the front, under cover of darkness and in the rain, John and a friend saw their opportunity to escape. He wrote, we lay down on the ground and hid behind the headstones as the rest of the group passed us by. In the darkness, we were later able to find our way to an abandoned barn and hid under the rafters in the hayloft. His mother and his sister were also taken away. Augie was helped by Raoul Wallenberg to get the proper papers that would later save her life. And his mother later escaped because a Hungarian soldier took pity on her. They made their way back to Budapest. John's father never made it back. In the meantime, John was picked up by the Russian army and transported to Kursk, Russia, where next to Stalingrad, the heaviest fighting of the war took place. He became so sick on the trains that he almost died in the transport. Many did all around him. John reports that although he was sick and had lost a lot of weight, at 6'2", weighing 120 pounds, by May of 1945, he had recovered and was working for a doctor in the work camp performing autopsies. At war's end, with the help of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, he was freed and sent back to Budapest where he met up with his mother and his sister. They encouraged him to use his having been born in France to make his way to the United States. That too had its harrowing stories of anti-Semitism and discrimination. After months of travel in, throughout Europe, when he finally arrived at the French border, an officer in Strasbourg dashed his host by stamping his travel papers as invalid. John being clever, always clever, and having worked in the book bindery, made his own solution. He writes, luckily, the invalid stamp was only visible on the backside of my travel papers. I don't remember how, but I found a book binding shop and had another piece of paper glued to my entry document. This worked to cover up the invalid stamp. In his optimism, he made his stay in France into a time of excitement as he waited for the opportunity to come to America. However, because he was going, it was going to be a long time before he would get that visa, he decided to respond to the Venezuelan government's request for strong non-Jewish farm workers. And with Hyas's help, he got on a ship to begin a new life there. He had a good ear for languages and soon took on various jobs as he saved money working for some Hungarian Jewish businessmen who owned restaurants. Finally, in August of 1949, he made his way through Havana to New York City and wide-eyed discovered a hotel near Times Square. After meeting up with his aunt and uncle who had sponsored him in Flint, Michigan, John made his way to the home of a friend from Venezuela who was living here in Cleveland. As he wrote in his memoirs, it was 60 years ago today, December 31st, 1950, when I first arrived at Cleveland, Ohio. Reading between the lines, it was clear that John was smart, ingenious even, well-educated, brave, bold, and lucky. His life could have ended so many times, and his journey could have gone in so many different ways. But with his charm and his wit and his resoluteness, he managed to get through the most daunting and horrific of circumstances Although 
they framed the picture of the man, John did not allow these incidents to be the center of his life. He pictured a different life for himself. He created the next chapter with great gusto, and he met the woman who would become his partner in fashioning a beautiful life. They met at one of his early jobs selling advertising. Having arrived in Cleveland only a few months before, a buddy of John's introduced them. She was, John said, a nice person and a pretty girl, his standards. And Eleanor was his guide to becoming American. While she began by speaking with him in Hungarian, she forced him to go to John Hayes High School for English lessons. They made a handsome couple, always dressed elegantly and often engaged with their friends. And for 67 years, they were quite the force in Cleveland to be reckoned with. They could be a little temperamental and stubborn with each other, but they also laughed together and enjoyed life together. John had a wonderful, deep laugh, and if you were blessed to hear it, you remembered it. He often laughed at his own amusing antics. By the time Larry was born, John's life seemed to be back on track. At that point, his mother and his sister also made it to America, settling in Chicago. Augie and he stayed very close. As she said, as kids, she adored having a big brother who introduced her to many things. And although he didn't always like it, he let her hang around with his friends. Augie, you said, he was my idol, and the years and the distance did not diminish the great fondness that you had for each other. As John and Eleanor's family grew, with Ronnie born within a year of Larry, and then in 1960 Dennis completed the trio, there was a clear understanding that this extended family also would always place their Simchas as a top priority. You shared special moments with your children and with each other's grandchildren as you traveled back and forth to be with each other and to keep families close in a multi-generational way. The whole family was going to be together this weekend in Chicago to celebrate Augie's 90th birthday. And what a blessing that all of you are here to share this moment with John's family. John's nieces and nephews adored him. Jimmy and Julie and Andrea on his side and David on Eleanor's side are all here to pay tribute to this man who left an impression on everyone he met. No doubt that was most true of his children. In Hebrew there is a word nora. Nora has the connotation of both awe and fear. That word comes to mind as the way you viewed your father. You had complete respect for him, treasured him, and loved him, and knew you deserved the discipline he sometimes meted out. He had strict rules about being home at early hours when other kids were still able to go out, stay out and play. He would call you in that it was your bedtime. But he was instilling in you a kind of self-discipline the kind of self-discipline that it would take for you to, a long time for you to understand, perhaps. Look, he himself was very mischievous as a young man, getting into trouble at school, not following all the rules. God only knows that that tenacity probably saved his life more than a couple times. So you couldn't really pull that much over him. Not much rattled this man after his experience as a young man. But three boys, you boys, in an age that, in the age that you were maturing, probably deserved the corporal punishment that came with the slipper squat or belt to the bottom. He had a theory, appropriate in its day. Hit now, ask questions later. <laughs> and when Ronnie vandalized Hilltop Elementary School, I see some of you remember this. A student there himself and caused the police to come and take him to the police station, along with many other kids involved, perhaps you. Unlike the other parents who came immediately to fetch their children, 
John let Ronnie wait there for six hours to teach him a lesson. Imagine a nine-year-old. And that was probably, he probably only rescued you because your mother made him stop. She often buffered for you, for all three of you, even when clearly you were wrong. And that's the thing, John was more often right, and you were just slow to figure that out. An artist with an impeccable eye for color, he and Dennis got into it over what Dennis was going to wear his first day as a lawyer. No doubt John was incredibly proud of you. That was clear about all three of you every time I spoke with him. But he wanted you to look the part that day. You told him that you were going to wear a navy sport coat with brown pants. And because he was an artist, painting every Tuesday night for your whole childhood and even picking it up later these last 10 years, when he told you those colors did not match, you should have believed him. Instead, to emphasize his point, he sent you a letter, Dennis, on which he had drawn two boxes, and he colored one in with a blue pencil and another one in with a brown pencil. Clearly, he was right. If only you had studied the Crayola crayon box better and had said khaki pants, you could have spared the whole ordeal. For all three of you, he gave you the once over from head to toe every time you came in evaluating what you were wearing. He'd offer you advice like, wear those pants to cut the grass, shine your shoes, where's your belt? And the sage advice of, you're a businessman dressed like one. He, of course, always looked perfect. He had a tie and a suit, whether he was meeting with city officials or visiting the properties. I'm going to share with you some words that Larry wrote to really to emphasize the impact he had on this community and most importantly on his three sons. My dad had a number of jobs upon first moving to Cleveland. He sold advertising for the Salsa Day, Cleveland's Hungarian newspaper, and also hosted a Hungarian radio show on WERE 1300 AM. It wasn't until 1952 when he joined Clara Kadar Realty that he found his true calling in real estate. He started his career selling very inexpensive real estate on the near west side of Cleveland. Their office was on the corner of 28th and Lorraine, and what we now know as Tremont and Ohio City were just a couple of the many neighborhoods in which he worked. It would be a long time before Professor Avenue and Bridge Avenue and the 25th and Lorraine would become the hipster neighborhoods they are today. My dad and his partners would buy very inexpensive homes, fix them up, then sell them for a profit. What we now know as flipping, they did this hundreds of times. Over time, Cleric and Kadar took on several different iterations until it became Walden Fisher, as it is known today. Over the years, the company went from buying and selling inexpensive homes to specializing in selling smaller apartment buildings, shopping centers, and other commercial real, real estate property. At the same time, my dad and his partners were building and buying apartment buildings, shopping centers, and office buildings. The brokerage business went by the wayside, and they started buying only for their own account. Today, we own and manage our own portfolio of shopping centers throughout greater Cleveland, southern Ohio, and the Carolinas as well. My dad was partners with Marty Wald for over 60 years, and eventually partners with his son, Eric. I came into the business, this is Larry, I came into the business at age 18, right out of high school, working summers while in college and starting full-time two days after graduation. That's right, two days. No backpacking around Europe, not to mention trips to the Far East. While I was still living at home, my dad would wake me up at 6.30 every weekday, and we were in the car down Fairhill to Carnegie over the bridge to 28th and Lorraine. There was no I-480 either in those days at the office by 7.45, and some days we wouldn't leave until after 6.30. My dad taught me everything I know about listing and closing a deal. He taught me that a no is a maybe, 
and a maybe is a yes. He would go into someone's office or home to close a listing or a sale, and he would tell me to follow his lead. When things got tough, he would get up and walk out the door and expected me to do the same. I've got to admit that the first few times I was kind of nervous, but eventually I got the hang of it. The buyer or the seller would always back down and ask us to come back and sit down. I don't remember a single instance where we lost a listing, sale, or a commission because of it. It was a lesson I continued to use throughout my career. While I was in college, my dad would call me with excitement in his voice to tell me that another one of my listings had sold and a commission check was on its way. The checks weren't enormous, but money for pizza, subs, beer, and pot were never an issue for me. With every call, he was almost, if not more, excited than I was. Eventually, after a career in travel, Ronnie joined the firm developing subdivisions and managing property. After a career in law, Dennis did the same and oversaw our leasing operation. I know my dad was particularly happy and proud to have all three of his sons in the business. My dad loved to buy older apartment buildings, shopping centers, and office properties, and then renovate and rehab them and watch the value of each property rise. He knew each and every building superintendent, housekeeper, and garage attendant on a first name basis and made a habit of visiting all the properties as often as he could. He had also a great eye for color and design. In fact, he was a bit of a frustrated architect. Other than maybe his grandchildren and golf, nothing made him happier than fiddling around with plans, tracing paper, his ruler, and numerous colored pencils. Many more times than not, my dad represented us before city councils, planning commissions, and zoning boards. He had wonderful relationships with mayors throughout the greater Cleveland area as well. He did his best to be uh, the humble Hungarian immigrant, accent and all, and charmed the best of them. Even at age 92, my dad continued to come into the office on a daily basis until he became seriously ill earlier this year. So you can imagine he wasn't jumping for joy when I decided to retire at 48 and move to Southern California. I don't think he ever came to understand my move, but over time he accepted it. He and my mom came out to visit a number of times and he seemed at peace with the life that I had and the friends I had made. What I do know for certain is he was very happy I decided to move back in May, stick my nose back into the business and spend time with him while he was healthy and help out as things took a turn for the worse. As it turns out, there were many more bad days than good days at that time, but I couldn't be happier that I was here for both. I want to share with you what no doubt many of you could have written about John as someone you engaged with in work that was written by Steve Bellman. He wrote, I really truly liked and admired John Fisher. He was always fair, always a gentleman, and I never came away from talking to him without learning something valuable. What is clear is that John could be, and I quote some of his friends, a benevolent dictator, but he was beloved because of it. He and Marty Wald had a good split. John did the creative and physical stuff, and Marty paid attention to the business side. And then they played golf or bowled together a few times a week. John really was a man's man. And he had his card games, hated chit-chat. And once he decided to stop calling all the public golf courses for tea times and joined Beachmont, he liked eating at the men's grill. He also liked eating lunch out at other bargain places like Bob Evans. And his favorite date for all of these was Ronnie, who only had lunches because his dad wanted to. He'd say of you, and I think this is a great compliment, he'd say of you that you were the daughter he never had. <laughs> but that is, that is because you were so attentive to him in every circumstance. 
and he did acquire daughters. He acquired them when Luann and Marcy came into the family, and he kept Sheila close too. And he was also a charmer when it came to women, but it was his grandchildren who he charmed the most. Kara, Jordan, Teddy, Jake, Joey, Matt, and Ken, he did adore each of you for your own energy and your entrepreneurship. As little kids, he would introduce you to some of the important things in life, like ice cream drenched in Kahlua. And he taught you to order only as much food as you would eat. Not just wise, but probably a holdover from his own childhood. He was frugal, except when he'd generously hand you money and claim that Grandma made him do this. Or the money came in beautiful cards that he would draw for you and often cut out your picture to place just in the spot where a face was supposed to go. Many of these you've kept as priceless treasures. You children, now all adults, would hear him say often that his favorite charity was his grandchildren and that twinkle in his eyes when he talked about you was always there. He was protective of you. Recently he used up his secretaries Louise and Anne's whole day having them research all the places in Hawaii that Matt should travel to instead of going to Southeast Asia. <laughs> Across every page he wrote beautiful he did love beautiful scenery, and he and Eleanor had traveled extensively around the world, including to Hawaii and on many cruises. It helped a lot that at that time Ronnie was in the travel business and would move them to first class and put them in beautiful hotels for free. And they also kept a place in Florida from the time that Dennis was only 15, leaving him alone to make his own rules, it seemed. But you all enjoyed visits there. John was sensitive to the needs of his grandchildren, offering you wisdom and modeling for you the way to treat everyone, except, of course, his sons, about whom he would affectionately say, I treat my three kids all the same, like dogs. <laughs> he had some quotable stuff, like that he wanted the whole nine yards, soup to nuts, he'd say. And speaking of yards, it didn't matter what was happening on the football field. He never stayed for a whole Browns game. He wanted to beat traffic. That John Fisher was blessed, though, to stay for the whole of 93 years. That he didn't leave too early, that he would miss the sweet opportunity to be devoted to his beloved wife, Eleanor, and to take care of her those last four difficult years. He was grateful to Keisha for being his right hand with Eleanor and for him to the end, and that John had the opportunity to see his three sons reunited in, bus in a business he loved, sharing the values he cherished was truly his blessing and yours, and that John was privileged to see his grandchildren grow up to be fine adults, meant that he could cook for you, his famous steak or egg frittatas, but more importantly, he taught you by making you sit down and letting him do all the work. A life lesson of how to care for others. John was almost the whole nine yards of, life of a lifetime. And we, myself included, were blessed to have him for the special years of our lives. With respect and admiration for the beautiful picture of a life well lived that he has left for each of us to admire and to emulate, we join with the sages to declare, Zichrono Livracha, may his memory always be our enduring blessing. Amen. I'd like to invite his granddaughter, Kara Fisher, to come forward and to share a few words of memory as well. My grandpa Johnny was a gifted storyteller. He could captivate an audience, hold court at any table, and his stories had the unique ability to make you laugh while also teaching you a lesson, even if you didn't think you needed one. My favorite stories have always been those of his childhood in Hungary and his journey to America following the war. 
My grandpa's immigration story is both universal in his desire to realize the American dream, and particular to the unique moments of setback and success that he endured with humor, strength, and perseverance. After a several year stay in Venezuela while waiting for his visa, he was finally on a ship headed to the States. He loved to say that when he found out they were making a pit stop in Havana, he was excited because that's where he heard all the girls were. And he loved to talk about those first few days after landing in New York, what he paid for his Times Square hotel room, and the awe he felt during a short stay with his cousin at Grossinger's Resort in the Catskills. My grandpa was the embodiment of a self-made man, and he always instilled in me and my cousins the importance of education, of hard work, and of experiencing culture in new countries. But he didn't only lecture us, and he was known to do that from time to time. He was genuinely interested in what we were learning in school, what was challenging us at work, and to where we were planning our next trip. Because he and my grandma were fortunate enough to travel the world together, more often than not, he had a list of recommendations to share and a funny story to go along with them. He took such interest in our lives, the details big and small. What part of the city was I living in? What was the square footage of my apartment? How much was I overpaying in rent? <laughs> but all of these questions came from a place of wanting to know that his family was taken care of, and that the seven of us in particular had access to the education and opportunities that he had worked so hard to make possible for us. For nearly 35 years, my grandpa and I have shared a special bond. He loved to tell me that when I was a baby, he would often bathe and diaper me. And when he would come back from Florida during the winter without my grandma when he was still working, he would ask my mom if I could spend the night, during which he would make me steak for dinner and waffles with powdered sugar for breakfast, two of his staples before taking me to school. And while I'll always cherish our Florida memories, trips to Lion Country Safari, swimming in their backyard pool, and evening Monopoly games where he always beat us, it's our more recent memories during quiet conversations over home-cooked meals in his condo that will forever be etched in my minds and in my heart. My grandpa Johnny was truly the patriarch of our family. He was both commanding yet so loving, and he was the strongest person I've ever known. On this date last year, I was in Budapest, a central place of my grandpa's story. I stood at the doorstep of his childhood apartment building, carrying a map that he had mailed to me with his address handwritten across the top. I will always be grateful for the chance to connect those stories to such a special city. My grandpa lived a long and full life, and for the rest of mine, as I carry his stories with me, I will also carry our stories, the ones we were fortunate to write together. May his memory be for a blessing. Each of us has precious memories of Jen. We take a moment now as we silently compose the eulogy of our own hearts. God to receive John's soul with the words of El Malay. Please rise. El Malay Rahamim Shochen Bamromim Am Semen Ochan Ochana Tachat Kanfeh Hashchina Vimalot Kidoshim Otorim Al Mishkavo, Vinomai, Amen. O 
God, full of compassion, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest under your wings to our beloved John Fisher, who has entered unto eternity. Master of mercy, let his soul be bound up in the bond of eternal life. The eternal God is his inheritance. May he rest in peace, and let us say, Amen. You may be seated. Our service continues at Mount Olive Cemetery, and the family invites you to join them for Shiva at the home of Luann and Ronnie Fisher, which is 305 Capitol Hill Circle in Orange, following the service until 7.30 tonight, and then tomorrow beginning at 6 o'clock. In lieu of flowers, contributions can be made to the Jewish National Fund or a charity of choice. Thank mm -hmm. you. 